In Paris, there is an area that used to be called the New Athens because of the number of artists there. As well as painters and writers, it was an area popular with prostitutes who plied their trade in the shadow of the church of Notre Dame de la Rite. But there was also a more respectable element, including bankers such as Auguste Degas. On July the 19th, 1834, his son was born there, Hilaire Germain Edgar. While he was still a child, Edgar moved with his parents from the Saint-Georges district of Paris to the area of the Luxembourg Gardens, to what was then Rue de l'Ouest, now Rue de Sasse, and then on to Rue Madame. His mother died shortly afterwards, in 1847. It's hard for us to know the effect this had on the young Edgar. He seldom mentioned her in later life, whilst he frequently liked to talk about his father, his dear papa. At school, Degas was an average student, but he was often described as uncommunicative and in the clouds. He received decent grades in drawing, but other pupils did just as well, if not better. Nothing would have made one think here was a painter of genius in the making. However, after completing his schooling, Degas decided on a career in art, and on the 7th of April, 1853, a few days after leaving school, he was given permission to copy at the Louvre. We are still unsure why he chose his path so quickly, but it was a decision that would affect the history of art. It wasn't long before the young Degas began attending classes with the painter Louis Lamotte. In 1855, he was admitted to the prestigious École des Beaux-Arts, coming 33rd in the entrance competition. It was around this time that Degas met Ingres and followed the latter's advice when he told the young painter after seeing some examples of the work of Degas, never from nature, young man, always from memory and the engravings of masters. With this and other advice, Degas sought to capture in the work of his predecessors the correctness of expression, the right formula, the technical secrets he wanted to incorporate in his own paintings. He distilled from these masters the inevitable biases that are the foundation of an artist's work. In the late 1850s, he used pencil to copy a chalk drawing, portrait of a young woman attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. He did this time and again, not just copies or dull reproductions, but subtle variations on an old theme. In 1856, Degas decided to spend some time in Italy. In Rome, he put portraiture to one side and opted for more conventional studies. History paintings which were never completed, paintings of local people and copies of old masters. Through an artist he met around this time, Gustave Moreau, Degas was to be introduced to the work of Delacroix. It was this that added an appreciation of colour and movement to the reverence he already had for the style of Ingres. With this hunger for work and the assiduous study of other painters came a great deal of self-doubt. He had a tendency to doubt everything, including himself, to jump into projects, only to leave them just as quickly. But, just as he was complaining about portrait painting being boring, he finished one of his most important oil paintings at the time, Family Portrait, later renamed The Belili Family. Lily Family is an interesting painting in the context uh, of 19th century art. It's, on one hand, it's a, 
a very uh, traditional conversation piece, a family conversation piece. If we then begin to analyse it in terms of the relationship to the guy himself, this of course is uh, his own family, the, the uh, paternal side of his family, it, it, Italian. And uh, it, it's quite clear that as one begins to look at it, the, the careful composition is actually telling us about the relationship uh, within that family. It is here that Degas begins to show a taste for domestic drama, a tendency, as the writer Paul Jameau put it, to lay bare the hidden bitterness between figures, even when they seem to be presented to us as merely portraits. In this painting, one would expect to see um, happy, smiling faces. Uh, what we see is the Baron um, virtually with his back to us. The Baroness, she stands in the middle of the room. Um, she's very erect, rather aloof, rather proud. Um, and her, ch her children, her daughters, uh, are with her. His wife's expression is disdainful and cold. The little girls, I think, are fine, but there's obviously something happening between the two adults which is not quite comfortable. It would therefore give us an indication uh, that that family was not necessarily a happy family, a loving family. Uh, it was very respectable and to outward appearances was very upright and honourable. In the autumn of 1859, the painter returned to Paris and moved into a spacious studio in the part of Paris where he'd been born. With a return to Paris, he also returned to history painting and tackled his largest historical canvas, the daughter of Jephthah, in an effort to emulate the sweeping works of his then hero, Delacroix. At last, Degas indulged in the delights of color, using unconventional juxtapositions of tone and scattered explosions of vibrancy across the whole painting. With another historical canvas, Semiramis building Babylon, Degas employed another unconventional technique with his use of essence, which is oil paint from which the oil has been blotted and thinned with turpentine, then applied to woven paper mounted on canvas. He tends to use this word painting essence. Uh, now, in fact, this was a, a sort of um, method he adopted uh, to dry out the liquid oil paint. Um, that is, he, he soaked off uh, excess, what he considered excess oil, uh, out of the oil paint, leaving what we call a short, very sticky, stiff thing, uh, which you could then apply. And indeed, in some ways, you can't, until you look up close, you can't tell the difference between pastel and this dry, short uh, oil paint. Degas used colour differently from the other Impressionists. His use of colour is restrained in his ballet dance dancer pictures, the ones of the 70s. He used white, sometimes pink, sometimes a little touch of pink or a little touch of red, and that could be the only bright colour in the whole painting. When he did his outdoor paintings, for example, with the race horses, the, the colours there could be very, very strong, but again, he didn't use a lot of colours. It wasn't until he started doing his pastels in the later part of his life, in the 80s and 90s, that he really went wild with colour. Between 1859 and 1865, Degas turned out an enormous volume of work which, nevertheless, left him feeling that he was not progressing. He became completely taken up with his art, which left him seeming aloof and grumpy. His impatience with people was becoming legendary even then. Then, around 1865, things started to change. With his painting, Scene of War in the Middle Ages, he was finally allowed to exhibit at the prestigious Salon in Paris, which he continued to do regularly until 1870. Apart from this canvas, he seemed to have forsaken historical paintings and until early in the next decade, 
concentrated solely on portraits. As well as his art, his friendships were in transition too. His relations with Gustave Moreau, one of his closest friends up to this point, seemed to have cooled. And he barely saw another close friend, Bonnar, after 1863. He began to forge closer links with yet another painter, James Tissot, who shared his taste and cultural background. But more than anything, it was his link with Edouard Manet that was to prove to be the most important for his future. It is understood that they met in 1863 in the Louvre, where Degas was etching a copy of a Velasquez painting directly onto copper plate. Manet was astonished by the boldness of an artist younger than himself and gave Degas some advice when it became clear the copy wasn't turning out as well as he might have wanted. So began an important and enduring friendship. Both Degas and Manet came from the same sector of society. They were both from the old bourgeoisie, the upper middle class. But Degas, uh, in the early part of his own career, um, worked rather in the spirit uh, of the Salle. He painted historical pictures. And when he met Manet in the Louvre, um, Manet introduced him to contemporary art, to the ideas of contemporary themes, so that Degas, in a way, came to the idea of painting uh, modern contemporary subjects rather later than Manet um, but his uh, sense of uh, where that contemporary idea was to lead him probably uh, in the end led him further uh, than Manet himself was prepared to go It's difficult to weed out fact from fiction in regard to these two giants of late 19th century art but their bond seems at its strongest in the 1870s but before we get carried away by the notion of a mutual admiration society, both men were given to delivering cutting jibes about each other. Manet cruelly attacked Degas' lack of interest in women, while Degas criticised Manet's bourgeois tendencies, his ambition, and the celebrity he had enjoyed ever since the Salon de Refusé, an exhibition of paintings that had been rejected by the Salon. The relationship between the Impressionists was not necessarily very easy. And the relationship between Degas and Manet was a good, good example. Um, they certainly did um, uh, affect each other in the sense that they stimulated each other, but they also uh, at times argued violently. <laughs> A theme which recurs again and again in Degas' work is his interest in race courses, which began after his many holidays in Normandy with his friends, the Valpinsons, starting in 1861. Their estate, Menil Hubert, was near the racetrack at Argenton, and the rustic setting reminded Degas of the English coloured prince he loved so much. to his friends, Tissot, Moreau and Manet, Edgar Degas was a complete unknown, though he had achieved some note amongst other artists of the time like Renoir, Sisley, Monet, Cezanne and Pissarro, where he was known for his cutting wit and his uncompromising artistic views, 